What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Bible Sessions. With me, I'm Jonathan James, and I want to dive into some things today. Well, a little bit of, I want to first, you know, stop and open with some prayer. So, Father God, I ask that you just fill this message with you. Because it's backed up by the scripture in the Bible. Father God, I hope that you can just resurrect these words and push them into the ears of the people that need to hear them, including myself, God. I pray for your dominion of your Holy Spirit to bring this message loud and clear and understandable to everyone who listens. I pray that you come through me so I can teach with these words. So your dominion of your Holy Spirit will walk through us and live with us so we can understand the things that are going on in our lives. Especially when we choose that Christian faith, God, I just pray for your spirit to watch over us and watch everything that we do so we don't fall away from you. I pray for the backslider. I pray for the addict still suffering. God, everything tonight this message, I hope it just glorifies you. So in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, welcome everyone to uh, Bible Sessions. Tonight's episode is going to be about backsliding. Uh, I put the title, Are You a Backslider? I'm not trying to point fingers at anyone, and sometimes it feels like that, but check it out. I've been a backslider too. I understand the thing. So first, let's get into what is a backslider. Some people don't know. So I got the definition pulled up here. Backsliding, also known as falling away or described as committing apostasy. We'll get into apostasy here a little bit. It's a term used within evangelical Christianity to describe a process which an individual who has converted to Christianity reverts to pre-conversion habits, like the way you used to be or you lapse or you fail and you fall into sin. When a person turns from God to choose a path of their own. Turn from God and go absolutely the other direction. Now, can you relate with that? Do you understand those kind of things that are going on in your life? I can relate. When you're on a good, holy path, everything's going good and you just, something comes in your life and you just get redirected. And sometimes it's redirected to a place that you don't even want to go. And one of the biggest things about backsliding is uh, it's not like an all of a sudden thing. It, it's, it's gradual. It's a gradual and silent process, honestly. We as Christians need to be on alert about it. And don't think that we are already sustained in grace and no matter what we do, we can just pray to God and ask for, ask for the forgiveness that it's going to automatically save you. But I will add this though, because I did a little bit of research on it, and there's some yays and nays about it, about uh, is a backslider still saved? Let's see here. Is a backslider still saved if they choose their own path away from God? Yes. If your heart is directed towards God, you can still, a, a Christian who falls back into sin is still saved, But at the same time, a person who lives a life controlled by sin is not truly following their faith. See, it doesn't equal out in a lot of places. And one of the things about it, you know, God doesn't have any favorites with any of us. None of us are his favorite. And especially when we're in sin, because God hates sin. And sin separates us from God. One of the biggest things about sinners, because I'm a sinner, saved by grace, sinners isolate themselves from God. They find every avenue they can possibly go and just try to be away from God and do things that don't include God. Uh, For some reason, it makes them feel comfortable, more comfortable. When When we give our lives to God and we sin willfully, we are separating ourselves from Him daily. 
And when we separate ourselves from Him, we get farther and farther away from everything He has planned for us. A lot of things in our life that are supposed to go according to His purpose. His will be done. We are out here in just a shell of people. We have our own lives. We have free will. We do all kinds of different things in our life, but we don't control our purpose. Yes, there's things that we do in our life that we can move a certain direction. We can get a certain type of job or education. Uh, a lot of things that we can do free will. But God, like I said, controls our purpose. One of the biggest things I can really urge and encourage you guys is to remove the sin, to gain access. Work hard on removing that sin daily because when you remove the sin daily, it becomes an easy habit. And having a habit of not sinning is awesome. I can go days and days and days and days without cussing and then someday it pops out. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sin. There's things or days and days without whining or complaining, but I still do it another day, you know. But I can tell you since my, I began my walk with Christ and gave my life to Him, it's becoming minimal. I'm giving up sin and gaining a closer access with God to the things that I know that I need in my life. And yes, I've been fully on fire with God. I've done so many things with God and for God, the music, the preaching, street preaching, uh, get-togethers, all kinds of stuff. And still found myself separated from God, backsliding. Back into the pit again. Back into everything that just tore me away from God. And I guarantee there's so many other people out there that have, have the same Relation. So we don't plan on the backsliding. I mentioned it's a gradual process. It's something that you know. Uh, Pastor Greg Laurie mentioned I, I when I was doing some of my uh, studying for this one. Pastor Greg Laurie says you're running around and running around and you fall down. He was talking about racquetball. When you run around, and you fall down. And all of a sudden, you hurt yourself. You didn't plan on falling down when you went to go play racquetball. And I'm paraphrasing what he said. You don't plan to hurt yourself. You don't plan to get in your car tomorrow and go to work and get in an accident and hurt yourself. There's all kinds of things. We don't plan, hey, I'm going I'm to step away from God today. I'm going to step away from all the things he has planned for me. We don't have that going on in our mind. But you start surrounding yourself with the wrong kind of people, the wrong environments, you will find yourself separating from God if that's the kind of environment you're in. Hanging out in bars, hanging around people still using an active addiction, you know. And some of us do that kind of stuff for our work. And some of you guys do it for your work too. But if we fully divulge ourselves into people that are separated from God, we may just find ourselves on a path where we find ourselves separated from God. In 1 Corinthians 10.6, this is where we get scripture. This is where the Bible strengthens this. This is, when I bring up the Bible, this is where people click out of this. They don't want to watch. But I'm so fired up about wanting to share the Bible, I must include it in all my teaching. 1 Corinthians 10.6 <clears throat> These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters. And some of them were as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ. As, so, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did. And they were killed by the destroying angel. We should never test Christ. We will never overpower Him. 
get the better of him, no more. Now, some of you might want to know, what does God say about backsliding? Well, the answers are in the Bible. The backslider will be paid back from his own ways, but a good person will be reward, rewarded for his or hers. That's found in Proverbs 14.14. 14. The backslider will be paid back for his own ways, but a good person will be rewarded for his. In God's rebuke of the nation of Israel, he equates backsliding with worshiping idols, which is a serious offense. One of the worst you can do. Worship other gods before our God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, it says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has ever overtaken you except what is common in mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so you can endure it. He's going to provide a way for you to get out of it. You find yourself tempted in, in, in sin that's going to push you farther into it, just call out God's name. Find something else that's positive that's going to take you out of that zone that you, where you don't want to feel. You know, if you pick up your phone, you want to start watching porn, or if you want to uh, just go down and, and and grab one joint or or a hit of some dope or something. Whatever the sin is, if you want to think about cheating on your spouse, you know, find something very positive that you can sit and think about. Talk to God. Lay out all the positive things you have in your life, and those are the ways that you're going to endure it. The thoughts and those feelings and those actions and those temptations are going to wash away. They're going to be gone. Remove the sin and gain access. Backsliding, you know you do it once the momentum builds up. Trust me, I've been there several times. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. That's just how I can relate. My sister said a few a week or so ago, start talking about what you've been through. And that's one of the greatest things. That's one of the greatest things any of us can do to have, have lived a life as horrific as I have and stuff that I've done and the stuff that you possibly have done in your life. Let's tell the story about what you've done, what you've overcome, the things that you came through. And it can't get more real than that. It cannot. So when I talk to you guys, I'm, you know, I've been through this. Revelation is 2.5. Remember, therefore, you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Remember when you were on fire for God and you just said that sinner's prayer and you just gave it to God and everything that you was feeling that was painful just washed away. You just felt re reborn. Remember that? Repent and do the works that you did first. If not, he will come to you and remove your lampstand. Unless you repent, that lampstand that's at your feet, guiding your path and pushing you along all the things that you need to do, repent. It means to turn away, to turn back away from sin. I'm sorry, God. You know, it, it, it all starts with I'm sorry. And as much as a lot of people don't want to hear I'm sorry, God will hear it. He'll hear your 10,000 sorries all the time. But you've got to truly mean it. I heard a pastor say last week or so, he says, you can say the sinner's prayer, but if you don't convert, it means nothing. If you don't change, it doesn't mean a thing. That's deep. Luke 9, 6, 2. Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back. When you put your hand to that plow and you look back on the kingdom, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. 2 Peter 2.21 For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. 
salvation, a free gift that we are given by God to do the things that, to live the lifestyle that's going to make our lives better for ourselves, our family, and everyone around us. Being a Christian is a lifestyle. It's a great lifestyle if you follow these commandments. Yes, it's going to be hard to turn from sin on a lot of accounts. But as you learn to do it, like I said earlier, it becomes minimal. You hang around other people and build yourself up. You know, make sure everyone in your circle is focused on the same goal of Christ as you are. In Galatians 4.9 it says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves do you want to be once more? Are you slave to the drugs, alcohol, pornography, what other, other types of sin, greed, gluttony, sloth, so many different things that are sins. I can get into number, uh, numerous of them. But again, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just pointing out scenarios. Now that you have come to know God and to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless things of this world? Sitting here today, I can know that I don't want to go back to that lifestyle I used to live. Homeless, hungry, drug addict, had a place, didn't have a place. I mean, there's so many different things. The ups and downs. There's a time where it just clicks and you just don't want to live like that anymore. Who wants to go back to trash? To go, Just imagine going back and laying on a floor just covered in cockroaches and trash and dirty diapers or whatnot, you know? Just uh, And you put up with that kind of stuff just to get your fix or just to stay with a certain someone or whatever it is. No one should want to live like that. I see it every day in the city and everywhere we go and online or whatever, but I see it firsthand. And a lot of them I, I really I know personally that I just don't, from my standpoint, I don't understand why they are still wanting to choose that lifestyle. And these are some people that need probably never even accepted Christ. A lot of people know who Jesus Christ is, one of the most popular people in history. But a lot don't believe his power. Some call it magical. Some aren't sure. But there are also people out there who have accepted Christ in their life and completely backslid on it and turned away and, and went the whole opposite direction and just and they're stuck in their sin. They're stuck in their mental health. That mental health, that demonic hold on a lot of people that you see people just yammering in public, talking to no one, uh, screaming at people as they walk by, yelling at traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, people who don't understand their gender or uh, don't... Uh, all that kind of stuff. Mental health, that's a demonic hold. You might think it's a crazy person going to rob you for your purse or whatever or take something from you, but that person is fighting a demon so deep they need prayer for all you knew that guy was an executive CEO business owner whatnot. we don't know what that person was going through we don't know anything that person was doing we just see them in their current state but we need to pray for the backslider the person that has fallen away we need to pray for the people who don't know Christ yet that's the most important part, to bring people to Christ, to show them, hey, this is what God did in my life. This is what God can do in your life. Can I pray for you? I know you're wiggling and flailing everywhere, but I need to pray for you. I need to pray for that demonic hold to come up out of you so you can start living your life again. Which brings me to a really important topic here. How do we encourage those who are backsliding? Think about it. First of all, we need to know that we should encourage those who are backsliding. In James 5.19 it says, My brothers and my sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, 
Whoever turns a sinner from their error will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Bring that person back if you can. If you're a godly person and you know that your prayer is powerful, you can bring that person back. I've seen it. I've seen people pray for me and bring me back. Even when I thought I lost my way. Far too many of us, including myself, give up on people. And God doesn't. Look at the story of the prodigal son and how he returned eventually. God specializes in bringing people back. He's still in the saving life business. And he uses us, uses us to do that. We are the vessels to go out and do this. That's why I get up on here and I do these videos. A fire is ignited inside of me that I have to let these people know what's going on. I can't sit and just do the bare minimum. And I'm going to get into something a little bit here. Just going to let you know about how easy people can just assume that there's a back slider, there's backsliding or there's sin involved in something. So I want to finish this up here. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is making his appeal through us. God specializes in bringing people back and he uses us to do that. It's very important that you recognize that God uses us for that purpose. When you don't feel like you're being used enough, read your scripture. That's what happened with me. About a little over a month ago, my family and I left the church that we were attending. And first and foremost right now, it's no ill will towards the church itself. I just feel I want to do more. My wife wants to do more. We want to be more community involved. We want to go and do something different. And I feel with my experience from my past and everything that I've built up and also my family's past, we can reach people the way it needs to be done. We want to bring people back. We want to literally walk in there Pray, 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 and get them back. When we left that church, like I said, I, got, I was getting texts and phone calls, people checking up on us, and what's is really a good thing. A lot of people should be doing that. Check on your fellow brother or sister, see what's going on. But they were convinced that there was sin involved while we left the church or something, something terrible. We hated somebody, and that's exactly wrong. We want to do something different, do something more. My wife and I have a vision for this ministry, and we want it to grow in a different aspect where we are going to do what we can in the community, together, and to grow our ministry to reach people that are truly lost, no matter what their background is. I want to pursue farther ministry, like actually go to school and learn how to really do it and be accredited when I go into churches and speak and local nonprofits and stuff. I want to be the voice for the people who don't have the voice. And that's why we left the church. To grow our ministry and go into several different avenues of it. Um, so we can cover a multitude of sins and bring a multitude of people back. That's what we want to do. Bringing people back. How do we do it? I should also describe the difference between backsliding and apostatizing. That word I mentioned in the very beginning, apostatizing. Apostatizing is somebody who has claimed to be a Christian, but never actually was a Christian ever. Had the look. Temporary Sundays, 
spent time around church and attended the church functions, barbecues, free food, music. And then they fell away, completely just stepped away. The Greek word for fall away is apostasia. Apostasia, yeah. It really means they fall away from the faith. They don't come back. Backsliding is when someone who is a genuine Christian goes through spiritual dryness, whether they're not conscious or whether they're not conscious of it or whether they don't even admit it. It's deep. And because they're going through so many so much spiritual dryness, all of a sudden they are now open to many temptations. I already walked away. I'm not going to church this week. I'm just going to go to the bar and do karaoke or you know, you know, putting yourself in the position, say you're an alcoholic and you know, and going and doing that kind of stuff. Why would you put yourself in that position? A lot of temptations come. You get drunk, you get lonely. You start looking for some fling, a one night stand. You see, one after the another, it keeps coming on. It, the temptations will grow. They are filled with other things. And so because of that, even though they are Christians, they are moving away. First thing is to pray for them. Always pray. There is power in prayer. Always. It doesn't matter what you say. Sometimes it might not make sense with the prayer you're saying, but if you are doing it in the name of Jesus Christ, it's going to come out. And just because it doesn't get answered right away doesn't mean you got to just throw in the towel, you're done. you got to keep pushing. And I know because I kept pushing. And I'm learning so much from it. It's real important. First thing is, pray for them. Before the verse in James, I quoted earlier, talked about a sinner turning a sinner from the error of their own way. It talks a lot about prayer, about the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous. So pray for them. I don't mean just pray. I mean actually intercede for them. Cry for them. Find the way that you need to be in their life and be there. Intercede, when it, even if it takes years, especially if it's someone you know and love. We can all relate to someone that we know and love, that we have that fervent prayer for. And we don't see any answers or anything. We don't see anything unfolding that's fixing the things we ask for in prayer. We still see our loved ones out there just living on skid row without a care in the world. I feel like I spend a lot of time praying now. More than three, four, five times a day. Pray. And as you pray and pray and pray, you get better at it. You start to understand. But don't sit there and just pray for everything that you think you want. Pray sincere for people. Be strong with them. The prayer of compassion, a prayer of love, fervent prayer for them because ultimately it's God that draws people back. We can't do it. I can't bring you back from where you're coming from. I can't bring you back from the way that you're living. I can tell you the good news and the way God brought me back and the way people He's brought people that I know back, the great stories. I can read the scripture and the Bible and everything that's going on in there. I can let everyone know how great God is and what He can do in your life. And once you start absorbing that and saying, yes, I know God can do this in my life, guess what? Watch the change. Watch the change that's going to come into your life. You're going to see it. You're going to understand it. You're going to feel it. When someone fervently prayers over you, this last Sunday, my wife got severely, pray, a really powerful prayer over her. You know, they had people standing behind her. And the guy told me, if she falls back, I got her. Just let it happen. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's do it. You know, I'm going to touch her back so she knows I'm back here. And after talking with her later, she said she felt like falling back. But she didn't want to fall down. Of course, because you didn't know that someone was back there. But the power of prayer, praying over an illness in your body, something that's going on in your life, the prayer has no... You can pray about anything. And I hope what you pray about is good. And there's a goal behind it. 
The second thing is to maintain a relationship with these people that are backsliding. Third is to maintain that relationship, but don't condemn them. Don't make fun of them or push them into a rut where they push them into a corner where they feel that they can't be open with you. If you're a backslider, the last thing you want to be told is you're doing no good. If your life sucks, you might as well just give up. Might as well just go kill yourself. Oh, you, you ain't going to get God's favor anyway. That's the last thing we do. We should not condemn the people that are backsliding. It's our job to love and God's job to change that person once they fully accept it. Don't talk in ways that make you look superior to them. I'm no better than you. I've been a mess up most of my life. And I finally found a way to get things together. In no way do I look to in no way do I feel superior to anybody. Just my dog. What? But I need to grow. What is I need to grow in my faith and show people how the power of prayer and the power of change can really rock somebody's world. The fourth is don't make them coming back the subject of all your conversations. Don't gossip about it. Don't tell everybody, oh, I think I'm going to get so-and-so back in here. You know, not, you know, hey, look what I did. I prayed for this guy. Or I brought him to this meeting. Or I brought him to church. You know, look at me, look at me, look at me. Don't. Don't put yourself in that position. Help people, help people because you love them. And that you want your prayer to work with them. The fifth is don't make it that it is never the subject of your conversations as well. You see, with four, you're not trying to always make your discussions something off-putting. But with the fifth thing, you're not trying to make them always comfortable in their sin. Sometimes people think, oh my goodness, you're a Christian. Oh, you're so godly. Oh, you can't do nothing wrong. Oh, oh. And when you get irritated or mad at somebody... You know, or your child, or your older adult kids, for one. Oh, you're so godly. Why would you talk to me like that? I mean, we, we get that. My wife and I get that from the older kids. Oh, I thought you were a man of God. Check it out. Save not soft. If I feel that you are in your sin, and you are super comfortable in your sin, and you're doing things that are very sinful, I'm going to point it out. I'm going to point it out with love and discernment. And I will be assertive with it. And one of the biggest things that bothers me about that is that people think just because you're Christian, you got to do everything happy and loving. And you can't. And, and in some aspects, you just got to show tough love. And we show tough love because we showed way too much love normally. Giving out everything we have, exasperating all resources or whatnot. But these messages, preaching the word of God is something I can give. And when I see people that are just too comfortable in their sin, I'm going to point it out, especially if they're a really close person or a loved one. And as I get to know somebody I don't know, I'm going to, push it, I'm going to point it out and, and let them know. So you see, by maintaining the relationship and talking about other things, you, you are still in the loop. We're still connected. You start talking about people coming back and some of the stuff and it makes them feel uncomfortable. It, it pricks their conscience. It makes them feel uneasy. But you don't do it all the time so that, they, so that they don't stop talking to you. You don't want people to get pushed away. You want to show genuine, true love to people and that you truly care. Don't get into it if you don't truly care. If you don't truly care about someone's salvation or the way that they're living, don't get in it. Don't try to help. Don't do it for likes. Don't do it for the camera. You got to genuinely love someone if you're trying to bring them back from the backsliding. Or if they've never been to Christ, you're trying to bring them and disciple them into Christ. Do it out of real love. The point is to do it enough to remain there and to make them feel uncomfortable in their sin. And if you do it the right way, with the interceding and the prayer and all that, 
you're going to make someone feel uncomfortable in their sin. Because not everyone is exactly happy in their sin. They feel like they're not going to be in that zone if you keep pushing the positive love on them. It's going to be an amazing feeling when you get to pray and just love on somebody and watch them just become a, a miracle. It's an amazing thing. The sixth thing that we can do to bring back a backslider in case they stop going to church or a special program is say that a special program is going on in town or something having a gathering at your house or whatever, invite them. Bring them. Make them a part of your circle. But do it because you want to truly love on them. Send them a message, text them, call them, any way you can get a hold of them. With social media, it's so easy. A lot of people are on social media. Uh, not a lot of people have you know texting and phone calls and stuff, but a lot of people find a way to get Wi-Fi, texting apps and stuff like that. So send them a message. If you read an article that you think is helpful, send them that article. We do that all the time. We send people memes. We send people videos that we think are funny. What about sending somebody something that's going to redirect their life? Make them feel uncomfortable in their sin. Don't think that they're going to hate you for it. You've got you, you to find a way to show that great love, but also make them uncomfortable in their sin. And, and God will make them uncomfortable in their sin because we know that sin is very, very uncomfortable when we keep soaking in it. It's not good. Occasionally you may send them a Bible verse. We do that all the time. All kinds of things we send back and forth through online and whatnot. Now all these things that you're doing, you are doing them on the basis that you are praying because that is what you're asking for God's power to do. We are sending these articles and these texts and these messages and these invites out because that's the power God's going to work with. God's power will be manifested through all those messages. When you put something in front of somebody for so long, they are going to see, oh, well, that looks like it might be a good idea. It just starts to look a little bit more appealing to them. See right here it says, if you are not constantly praying what you are trying to do is do it with your own strength. You can't do it alone. You're going to need Jesus Christ. You're going to. It's going to be important. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't do it all by yourself. You're going to wear yourself out. We're not God. And that's why we need God. When we pray fervently with God, it's so strong. It's one of the strongest things you can ever put in your life. But we also don't want to be people who just pray and not trying to do something because God works through means. God's going to take care of it. I don't need to pray. That's all in God's hands now. No. Pray that it stays in God's hands and that's directed at God's hands. Pray for whatever situation that's going on in that person's life or your own life. Give it to God. Don't just think God's going to automatically take care of it so you don't need to be a part of it. Include yourself if you truly truly love that person or several other people. Now, you may not be the ultimate means that God uses to convert them, but that's not what you should even be worried about. About whether they mention you in their testimony or coming back. You just want them to genuinely come back. You want their life saved. Don't do it for the likes and the shares and the subscribers and all that kind of stuff. Who cares? Trust me, I've been that kind of person who used to, used to do it for those reasons. But more the, the more and more I study the Bible, the more and more I direct my life into what God's plan is for me, I see this vision so clear. Save to Serve Ministries is what I want to do. My plan is to be in full-time ministry. I don't know when, but my plan is to be in full-time ministry with my family. And this is how we do it. We truly love on people. 
We find people who are lost and just who have given up and we bring them back. And it's really good with there. Don't worry about they mentioning you in their testimony or their story or their videos. Just do it because you want them to live a better life. Being a, a Christian is a lifestyle. So I think that's how you do it. So I want to get over here. I'm, one of these things I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> I got the internet up here. It says, don't you see here? What is the danger of backsliding? A backslider is a Christian who gets out of touch with the Lord. We talked about this. It happens when someone who is devoted to God begins to take his or her relationship with Him less seriously. And you can relate to the, when you take your relationship with, with God less serious, what happens in your life. A lot of things become more serious in a bad way. And it's crazy. I see all these questions on here when you look at, you know, who believes in backsliding? Is backsliding part of the Christian faith? How can a backslider be restored? Is a backslider a, a sinner? You know? Because a backslider is one who formerly sinned, repented, and was forgiven, but now sinned again. Do we sin every day? So in a, maybe in a way we do all. We all backslide. But once you catch it, you got to catch it right in the instant and pray over it. Pray over it in something positive. To bring yourself up out of that. Repent and be saved again. That's the most important thing that you can do. And I'm hoping that I'm, on, that I'm making sense to a lot of people. And like I said, I'm not perfect. My message is I study the Bible and create something to talk about. You know? So I just, I feel God pulling me in a direction that I need to be into more sermons, in-depth personal Bible study, getting fed with my wife alongside me, and so much more is to come with this. We know that God doesn't want anyone to perish. That's written in 2 Peter 3.9. That He gives the increase, 1 Corinthians 3.6. And that He wants us to preach the gospel, Mark 16.15. As I approach an invitation, I am eminently aware that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. John 6.44 It's all written in the Scripture. They're not just made up stories. There's so much evidence of Jesus and the way and His followers and everything that happened in those times. A lot of people think these are just stories. But think about Everything all around you, the things that you have, how you just didn't miraculously appear out of thin air, you know. God built all this, created it all. Read the scripture. Stuff that was written thousands of years ago is happening today. There's not someone just sitting there re editing a Bible and having it make sense for what's happening today. There's, that's not what's happening. And when you're a true Christian and you feel that faith and you feel that understanding in your life, you're going to understand it. You're going to understand that the Word of God is real. What's written in the Holy Bible is real. Feel it. Fall in love with it. I'm going to end here with a little altar call. I just want to let everyone know that I love you, and I hope whatever you're going through that maybe you don't know Christ or you want to feel Christ or you're not sure how to do it, reach out to me. Reach out to several of those people out there that you know. There's churches on every single corner. They may not all be good ones or preaching the right message. I'm not sure. It's not for me to say. But if you preach out of the Holy Bible, those are the words people need to hear. Those are the stories people need to hear. Stories of triumph, sadness. Jesus died for us for a reason. So I want to pray right here. Lord Jesus, I want to experience your mercy today. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins and for your sins. 
I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I'm inviting you to be in mine right now. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Live in me as my leader from now on. I believe you are the God who is rich in mercy. I love God. One of the most important things I ever think I've ever done in my life. The most meaningful things I can do in my life. What helps me become a leader to my family. It's not hard. If it's like you feel refreshed in the Word of God. And if you haven't been in the Word of God, I urge you to get into the Word of God. Find yourself local with the Bible study or something. There's, there's a bunch going on. Put yourself in that circle. And if you're afraid to find out where that is, reach out to me personally. You can get a hold of me all over the internet on here. Message me. I'll give you my personal phone number. We can talk. And that's real talk. I'll leave with this. A decision apart from a transformed life does not characterize a Christian, but rather a false convert. Give in to that sinner's prayer and let it truly change who you are. Repent and turn away from your sin. If you want a better life, there's one wait for you because God planned you to have a better life than you're having right now. I absolutely believe it with all my heart. It's amazing how that works. A decision apart from a transformed life does not characterize a Christian, but rather a false convert. Matthew 7, 16 through 20. God bless every single one of you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Save to Serve Ministries 2024. I just hope this message reached somebody. Tune in again next week, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for another message. We're going to keep this going because I'm on fire and I got stuff to share with you guys. And by doing this and teaching you guys these and, and sharing what I'm learning, it's keeping me on point. It's helping me. It's a great therapy. And you keep Jesus Christ in the forefront. God bless every single one of you. I love you guys.